えっと、じゃあ,あの、バリー・バリッシュ教授のですね、簡単な紹介ということで、そ、so、れは、まあ、プロフェッサー・バリッシュ。That will be the main theme. And astronomy and physics is the subtitle, if you will. And there was a similar remote presentation that was made. But、uh, this is、uh, the digest version of that presentation. And in 2017, Professor Barish received a Nobel Prize in physics, but、uh, he was awarded with a large number of awards. Of course, the largest was、uh, the Nobel Prize in 2017. As you can see, even before receiving the Nobel Prize, he was given、uh, so many. And in terms of uh, uh, his uh, research, so in a broad area of、uh, astral uh, physics, uh, big science in particular, uh, with uh, large scale science,、uh, he has done extensive research、uh, in particle physics as well as、uh, astrophysics and astronomy. And the characteristics of、uh, Professor Barish、uh, are such that he would uh, uh, focus on the most uh, crucial and important scientific uh, uh, challenges of the time, and he would develop uh, the uh, state of the art technology unprecedented uh, for the time uh, required uh, for that research, and he will gather uh, top class uh, personnel and talents, uh, demonstrate strong uh, leadership uh, uh, to the team. And、uh, utilize a methodology that is、uh, carefully thought out to execute the project. So, in 1962,、uh, he acquired a PhD at、uh, Berkeley University of California, and he moved to Caltech in 1963, became researcher, associate researcher, and professor, associate professor and professor. And、uh, he went to a Brick Heavens uh, Institute, uh, SLAC, uh, and then a Fermi Institute. In 1970, at Fermi Institute,、uh, he proposed. Uh, an established neutrino experiment. And so uh, the reaction that was predicted、uh, in terms of、uh, the elementary particle uh, theory, uh, he first observed uh, the uh, neutral uh, current, a、uh, very weak、uh, interactions among them. And in 1975, Uh, he uh, did research on uh, tau rep lepton uh, in the uh, experiment, uh, Cornell's uh, electron uh, positron collider. And、uh, he also participated in、uh, DALCO. Experiment in 1978. One of、uh, the quarks is charm、uh, quarks,、uh, its generation and decay. And this is actually the theme of my PhD uh, paper uh, instructed uh, by Professor、uh, Berish. And so he was part of DELCO experiment in 1978. And starting from 1986, in Italy, in Gran Sasso,、uh, in underground, a、uh, macro experiment、uh, started to take place. He was part of that. So,、uh, to search、uh, particles with magnetic、uh, charges, neutrino physics, so magnetically charged uh, particles, uh, they do not exist、uh, in the current、uh, electromagnetic uh, theories, uh, but、uh, as Part of a broad range of、uh, elementary particles,、uh, they could exist.、Uh, there are electrons, but、uh, would particles be charged magnetically? Is the question. So in 1989,、uh, he acquired data in 1999,、uh, built a detector, and uh, in 2000, uh, uh, the research was completed. Although the existence was not noted,、um, he did、uh, excellent research into this. Had he discovered magnetically charged particles, he would have received the Nobel Prize. And in 1991, a GEM experiment uh, plan uh, started, and he was the lead. GEM, SSC Superconducting Supercollider in the south of、uh, Dallas, 87 kilometer 
あの家族機ですけれども、あ、そこに計画があったんです。There was a project to set up a, a such a large uh, uh, experimental uh, equipment, and however, in 1993, this project had to be cancelled by the US government. However, Uh, this uh, left a very valuable experience. A cost increase uh, must be tackled. Uh, how to promote international collaboration? Uh, this did uh, produce uh, valuable lessons. Uh, and then came LIGO. There are two detectors in uh, two sites, both are used. And uh, there's also collaboration with other research sites around the world. In principle, a kilometer-sized interferometer, uh, if we use uh, such equipment, gravitational waves uh, uh, should be observed. So that was the theory back in 1980s. And into the 1990s and onward, although uh, people knew that they could be observed, uh, enough uh, research funding was not given. And then came Professor Barish. So, uh, he became the lead of LIGO in 1994, and he restructured and re-established the research organization. Uh, 40 billion yen of research funding was uh, granted. In 1997, uh, two facilities were uh, almost complete. In 2002, uh, data started to be acquired. And in 2004, a LIGO upgrade started. Uh, necessary funding uh, was secured. And in 2015, uh, data acquisition using enhanced uh, upgraded uh, LIGO started. And uh, in 2016, first observation of uh, gravitational waves was announced. And in parallel with this, surprisingly, he also uh, led uh, the ILC, International Linear uh, Collider. So I LC. This is uh, the next generation uh, linear electron uh, positron collider. Uh, there's Higgs boson that's utilized, and that is to be looked into extensively by this experiment. So in the eight years between 2005 and 2013, he served as a director of uh, the ILC design team, and the design was uh, completed under his leadership. So astronomy and uh, particle physics, uh, where Professor Barish uh, has been very uh, active, I would like to provide a most simple introduction uh, to these uh, disciplines. So early in the 20th century, back then, Are the heavenly bodies in the skies? They were considered all part of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. And Edwin Hubble, Dr. Hubble, said otherwise. Outside of uh, our galaxy, uh, there were celestial bodies. And uh, when speed Uh, was uh, observed. So uh, the farther uh, the celestial body, uh, uh, and if it's uh, away from uh, the Earth, uh, then uh, it is moving at a faster speed uh, from Earth, and the uh, universe is uh, expanding, he said. So let's say that our universe is like a balloon. And uh, if the universe was two-dimensional, with the balloon uh, expanding, uh, the surface will uh, expand, and uh, the interstellar uh, distance uh, will grow. So uh, the larger the balloon, uh, seen from one celestial body, uh, the other bodies uh, will uh, appear uh, further. And uh, the speed at which uh, they move away becomes greater. So. Any celestial body is not special. There's no central body. So whichever uh, spot you choose on the surface of the balloon, it's the same with all the other ones. So there's no center in the universe. And Milky Way as a galaxy, Well, the farther uh, it is, uh, then the faster it moves away. But we're not at the center of the galaxy. George, and then George Gamow and others also were saying that if the universe is expanding, the universe must have started from a very small size. Then, at a small size, density is high and temperature must have been very high. 
So that is the so-called Big Bang. So universe started from nothing with the Big Bang. And with the Big Bang, universe started. And the current estimation, it was shorter back then, but the current estimation is that the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. This briefly explains that the history of universe. This is the timeline. Time. Uh, moves from this to that direction, starting from Big Bang. First, a very fast expansion happened, which is called inflation. And then uh, there was a sort of elemental particle soup, but they scatter, so it's not transmitted and things are invisible. It is bright, but there's nothing to be seen. And after universe expands to a certain level, light starts to be transmitted, and then universe about 3.8 billion after the Big Bang. This happens, but there are still no stars, so light is transmitted, but there's nothing that emits light. That is called the Dark Ages. About 400 million years after the Big Bang, the first star, the first celestial body appears, starts to shine with light, and expansion starts, and the galaxy and the planets developed and we are now at this stage and in this situation elemental element physics is this era and astronomy covers the later years so this is the Elementary particle soup. The theory we now use is called standard theory. And elementary particle, in principle, are particles that cannot be divided furthermore. So those are particles without structure, like water molecule can be divided into two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So there's a structure. So this is not an elementary particle. And if you look at the oxygen, there is a nuclei inside, and electrons are rotating around. So they have a structure. This is not elementary particle. And the nuclei of oxygen can be further be divided into uh, protons and so there's a structure and when you look at the protons this is made of three quarks which are called gluon they are connected through gluon so there is a structure so Protons are not elementary particles, which means that as far as we know, quark is a elementary particle because it's not possible to divide furthermore. So they are electrons, but as far as we know, there's no internal structure into electrons. And electrons According to the standard theory, it is classified as lepton. There are six types of leptons, and one is electron and quark. Is another classification. There are six types of quarks. So lepton and quarks together, they are uh, particles of material. So uh, like molecules of water and atoms of oxygen, they are made of these material particles. And reaction among them, the force among them, is managed by the gauge boson. And there is a photon which has electromagnetic power. And there is a weaker force treated by W and Z. And a stronger force which is managed by gluon. And among these gauge bosons, there is a reaction. But all these are related. And one more thing is a special particle called Higgs boson, only one type. This is said to be the source of mass of elementary particle. 
So this is a standard theory of elementary particle. And standard theory, I think we can say that is the core of the wisdom of humans. And there were about 20 Nobel Prizes related to this. So I said Higgs boson is the mass of elementary particle. So how is mass created? It is called Higgs structure, the structure to create mass. In a sink of universe without gas, without anything, that is full of Higgs bosons. And if there's an elementary particle with zero mass, then we react with the Higgs bosons to get mass. This might be difficult to understand, so let me just give you an analogy of a pool with water. So there's water in the pool, and the depth of the water is the volume or density of Higgs boson. And if there's no wave on the surface, uh, that is the vacuum of the universe. If there are waves, the wave is a particle. If there is a wave on the surface, it means that there are particles, and that particle would be the Higgs boson that can be observed. And then, let us say that a thin person and a fat person without mass enters the pool and walk. There was no mass, but there is the uh, resistance of water, so it's difficult to move. And the person who has more weight has a larger resistance cons compared to the person who is thin. So it's difficult to walk. The difficulty of walking is the mass. So the person who is bigger, who has more weight, has a big mass caused by the water resistance. The conclusion of this analogy is that the person who has more weight has a bigger mass, then that person must create more Higgs waves. And that person must have a better reaction with Higgs. But actually, the, and this analogy is nearly right. But when you say Higgs boson, feeling the universe is vacuum, why is it a vacuum? Why is it empty, though it is full? This is related to Buddhism. The vacuum of universe is filled with Higgs boson field. It's a vacuum, but there's a lot of Higgs. This is just like the Heart Sutra, color is emptiness, and emptiness is color. There's nothing inside. So, so what is not? What is is not, and what is not is what is. That is the meaning. And actually, insufficiency in nothingness, this is a Buddhist work, word. If there's nothing, means that there's infinite volume, and we also often talk about nothingness. If there's nothing, this also means that there's everything according to the Zen Buddhism. So this is nothing strange. Now, the Higgs boson, in, this was discovered in 2012 by CERN in the suburbs of Geneva. There's a big round collider, a large hadron collider with a perimeter of about 30 kilometers causing proton-to-proton -proton collision. This is a phenomena observed uh, by colliding uh, protons, Higgs uh, bosons were created, and the collapse of a Higgs uh, boson was captured to recreate new particles. And by reconstructing, the Higgs boson was discovered. The meaning of the discovery of Higgs boson is that this is the beginning of a new era of particle physics, early 20th century. This is a discovery of electron by J.J. Thompson and discovery of atomic nucleus by Rutherford. And with that, the new particle physics started. The discovery of Higgs boson 
was a great discovery of the era. And then ILC International Linear Collider is a collider, is a accelerator that will lead the new era. International Linear Collider, actually there were many accelerators candidates to study this subject, but ILC seems to be the most realistic. So, uh, so uh, Professor Barish led the design team of LC in UDX Akihabara on 15th of December. We had a ceremony to celebrate the completion of LC design. You can see him here. This person is Professor Yamada, uh, Professor Emeritus of the University of Tokyo. Uh, leading uh, this area. I'm representing the uh, Asian studies, and the only candidate site is now Kitakami. There is a moderate hill, and there's sufficient room for 50 kilometers. And access tunnel can be short. There are many advantages to this location. This is Professor Barish to introduce my relationship with him. Uh, in 2017, he came to Japan before the Nobel Award, and I gave him a tea ceremony to a Natsume, a Japanese lacquer container for tea. And last year, May, he became the doctor, honorary doctor of Valencia University, and I invited him to my home. And lastly, Professor Barish actually is also making a lot of research, but he's also very active in developing the youth. As Professor Ono mentioned yesterday, the day before yesterday, at the uh, Tokyo Forum Creativity, a junior workshop was held. Senior high school students and university students, about 20 of them participated, divided into three groups, and they all made heard from Professor Barish about gravitational wave and elemental particle physics and accelerator. And in one day, they had to make a presentation. On the following day, they made a presentation. This is the photograph of that presentation, and Professor Barish made his comment to their presentation. That is all from me, and now we hope we can hear about gravitational wave from Professor Barish.